Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep into the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. Available in video format at FunkinStuff.net on YouTube, Truth and Rhythm can also be enjoyed on the go. It's audio podcast edition from FunkinStuff.net, iTunes, and most leading providers. I am your host, Scott Dr. G.X. Goldfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One That First Guy to Funk. If you don't have your copy, you better hop on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be glad you did. It's great to be back after a couple weeks off. Uh, regular viewers may have noticed that we were off for a couple weeks and took advantage of that time to revamp the opening and closing title sequences. We have new music, courtesy of Dixie Freely, so we're very grateful for that. As always, whether you're watching or listening, I thank you for your ongoing support. If you've not yet subscribed, please do so. Subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube, and that's where Truth and Rhythm resides. Encourage friends and family to also subscribe. We need that support. Thank you so much. This episode features a true living legend, one of the most prominent, distinctive, and accomplished funk and R&B guitar players of all time, Mr. Ernie Isley of the rock era's first family, sorry Jacksons, the Isley Brothers, the fabulous Isley Brothers. Not only was Ernie's searing and soaring soloing out front on all 12 of the Isley's platinum selling three plus three band albums from 1973 to 1983, but he also played most of the drums too. Before Ernie was even out of grade school, the Isley Brothers, Ronald, O'Kelly, and Rudolph had already carved out quite a career for themselves as a vocal trio during the late 50s and 1960s. After starting out playing drums as a 12 year old in 1966, at just age 14, Ernie found himself holding down the beat for his famous older siblings. Notably, his first studio recording with the Isley Brothers was playing bass on 1969's funky smash hit, It's Your Thing. He then played guitar and drums on his brother's subsequent albums, Get into something, giving it back, and brother, brother, brother. In 1973, a new golden era of superlative funk rock and smooth R&B began when the older Isley brothers officially appointed Ernie on guitar and drums, youngest brother Marvin on bass, and brother-in-law Chris Jasper on keyboards as the group's band. As a teen growing up during that time, they were one of my very favorite groups and I wore out all of their albums. Not only was their overall sound immediately identifiable, but they were very unique in being equally adept at hardcore funk, guitar-driven rock, and sensual ballads. In fact, their work in any of those categories ranks with the best from that period. A sampling of their classic songs during that 73 to 83 time frame include Who's That Lady, Live It Up, Fight the Power, Harvest for the World, At Your Best, You Are Love, Take Me to the Next Phase, Cooling Out, Groove With You, I Want to Be With You, Here We Go Again, Hurry Up and Wait, Between the Sheets, The Pride, Living in the Life, Climbing Up the Ladder, Voyage to Atlantis, Footsteps in the Dark, and so many others. Those last five were from the 1977 funk rock masterpiece, Go For Your Guns one of my all-time favorite albums. The key ingredients to the Isley Brother formula, if you will, was the one-of-a-kind lead vocals from Ron Isley. He was masterful in both gritty and delicate settings. Then also Jasper, who was a classically trained composer and arranger, who had the distinction of being the very first Truth and Rhythm guest, so be sure to check out that episode if you haven't yet seen it. And then there was Marvin with his super funky bass playing and rhythms. And of course, the man we are about to get to know much better, Ernie, a blistering and masterful guitar player and one of my all-time favorites. In the early 1980s, the players notched some success on their own as Isley Jasper Isley, notably with the hit song Caravan of Love. In subsequent years, Ernie and Marvin reunited in various configurations with their older brothers. And as the only surviving brothers, Ernie and Ronald, continue to perform today as the Isley Brothers. Jasper also remains active and has released numerous solo albums. Speaking of which, Ernie delivered his only solo album, The Wonderful Highwire, in 1990. The Isley Brothers' many honors and awards 
included being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1992. In this episode's interview, Ernie talks about growing up in a household of music stars that for a time included Jimi Hendrix, what it was like breaking into the group, how he developed his signature sound, insights into their amazing albums and compositions, the hugely influential shadow the Isley Brothers cast in all contemporary music, and Ernie's recent collaboration with Carlos Santana. As is the case with all Truth and Rhythm shows, the video quality can only be as good as a remotely located guest's device internet connection permit. So bear with it here as the video does get choppy in spots, but fortunately the audio is mostly unaffected. While much ground is covered in this interview, there was so much more I wanted to ask Ernie, but I could only be so greedy with his time. So with that, I do hope you enjoy it. Hey there, you know, one of the great thrills of doing a show like this is being able to sometimes meet some of my musical heroes. And this episode of Truth and Rhythm is one of those cases because I have with me today none other than Ernie Isley, drummer, especially guitar player, composer of the legendary Isley Brothers. I'm so excited. Ernie, how are you? I'm good, Scott. And you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me. All right. Yeah, glad to be here. And here is from uh, St. Louis area, right? Yes. Except we're on the road tomorrow. I think we're going to uh, fly into uh, Arkansas. Arkansas. All yeah, right. and we got a show. We got a show uh, Friday. And uh, then we'll be back. Oh, and we'll be back here. So uh, St. Louis has been home for, for how long now? Uh, since the Rams won the Super Bowl, since they were the <laughs> St. Louis Rams. <laughs> That's like uh, December of 99. Uh-huh. All right. And time flies, man. Time. Yeah. It's like Almost uh, 20 years now. Yeah, coming up. Yeah, it's like, where did the time go? Exactly. You know, it feels more like maybe like five years, but uh, it's, it's time just zoom, man. It's gone. So, no doubt, I, I learned that especially after having a kid. It just goes True. by. Yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, I was telling you uh, before we started off air a little bit. I just want to share it with our viewers. You know, what a huge fan I've been since, you know, 75 or so when I was in uh, middle school. And just as soon as I heard, you know, the pride. Well, actually, before that, going back, you know, I had heard, of course, Who's That Lady and Summer Breeze. Mm -hmm. And I was really digging mm -hmm. on that. Uh, and as a, mm -hmm. as a very small kid in grade school, I bought the uh, Fight the Power 45 and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and got to hear what they were beeping out on the radio. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. And then uh, later on, uh, Go For Your Guns became a lifetime fan. So uh, much uh, respect and uh, just always have loved your, your playing and your style. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, actually, before we get going also, I want to share this with you. I have, unfortunately, it doesn't have your signature, but it's the uh, Showdown cover, it, of course, of Donald and Blair. Cover. But we got uh, Ronald on there from 1990, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe then, you know, who knows, maybe the next time that uh, we happen to be in the close proximity. Uh, and if you have that with you, yeah, I'll, I'll put, uh, you know, my signature on it. I'll take you up on that. All right. All right, so let's jump into it, Ernie. Tell me what it was like growing up in that Isley household, you know, that musical household with, you know, the incredible, uh, successful singing older brothers and your younger brother, Marvin, and just that whole scene. What was it like growing up in that? Um, for me, it felt normal. Uh, as far back as I can remember, uh, my brothers were singing and they were performing and, uh, you know, the, the record Shout, uh, when that came out, um, turned out to be like a, a real signature hit associated with them. But then 
it had to be one of those songs that everybody wanted to participate in. Everybody wanted to sing. And uh, obviously now, you know, we could, I mean, that song can be performed in uh, in Tiananmen Square in China and they would know what you were talking they would understand what you were talking about. Uh, th that song is everywhere, but that's only like the first hit in uh, one hit out of many, but uh, everybody's done that song. So what, how old were you when you realized, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, you were living with, uh, you know, some, some stars, some celebrities? Uh, maybe around the age of, uh, four or five uh, because there was always a sense of uh, excitement when they were around. Uh, I always felt that uh, the fact that they were members of my family and older brothers uh, and see them perform in a, a room you know, or a theater, you know, total strangers, you know, would, would lose it because of them. So it was uh, always uh, positive and exciting and uh, a sense of uh, discovery and adventure. Hmm. And what, what made you gravitate toward the guitar or did you first go to drums or how did your musical progression Take place. Well, I, I was, you know, like any young kid, you know, uh, growing up, I was interested in riding my bike and uh, going to school. Uh, really wanted to play baseball. Uh, loved baseball. But uh, I got into drums. I started playing drums at the age of 12. And I played my first live gig with my other brothers in Philadelphia when I was 14. And that night I also played behind uh, Martha and the Vandellas and uh, because they didn't have a drummer. <laughs> and between the shows, uh, after our performance, uh, I'm back in the dressing room with my stage clothes on. My oldest brother Kelly gives me a $50 bill and tells me go get a hot dog. <laughs> so my mind is totally blown. And I go through the backstage doors, still in my stage clothes. And when the doors swing open, there are about, I don't know, 15 or more girls my age that all screamed at me like I was uh, Justin Bieber. <laughs> and, uh, oh, you know, you, you play so well. Uh, oh, you're so cute. Uh, you go to school down here and uh, all this other stuff. Man, I was ready to move to Philly you know, right then and there because the girls in my school didn't act like that. Uh, so that that was a lot of fun. That was my first sort of like introduction to playing on stage, you know, with my brothers. And we had, amongst other things, we did uh, Shout and Twist and Shout and This So Hard of Mine at the time. Did, did you have any stage fright? I mean, you must have been... No. No, 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 not, not at 14. I think I had a little when I was, you know, maybe younger than that, maybe uh, uh, six or seven. I might have had a little stage fright. But uh, no, it just, it was uh, like an adrenaline rush. You, know, you can't, can't wait to get out there and uh, to do these songs and to, you know, see the reaction from the audience as you're, you're doing it. It was, it was a great experience. Wow. And so then from there, when did you pick up a guitar and, you know, how did you sort of decide that you really wanted to pursue that? Um, well, I went from drums to bass and uh, I'm the bass player on the record. It's your thing. Uh, at the time it was recorded, I was 16. Uh, and I was supposed to be the second drummer. But uh, I had played the bass uh, in our mother's house. And uh, I showed the bass player what I played. 
and of course, handing him his base, he uh, played it the way he felt. And just before we started recording, Ronald came over and whispered in my ear that you're going to play bass. And I was, my heart was pounding in my chest and scared, held on for dear life and played it. Uh, that was uh, November of uh, 68. And uh, It's Your Thing came out in the spring of uh, 69. Uh, I got my first guitar like... Uh, I think like September of 1968. And um, October, it turned out, was a, we did a rehearsal for the song It's Your Thing. And the guitar player who played on it, uh, Skip, his name is uh, Charles Pitts, but he's the same guitarist who also played the Wawa guitar on Isaac Hayes' Shaft. Mm. So, uh, you know, and I only had a guitar maybe like 30 days. And to see this guy and hear him play, like, blew my mind. And, uh, uh, but I got my first guitar in, like, September of 1968. And uh, by the time we did that lady, that was 73, I had been playing, like, like about four and a half years. But I caught on fast. And... Um, you know, you, we were only always chasing after the music. We didn't necessarily have an agenda or an outright plan. We just were chasing after the music so that um, to do things like, uh, if you can't be with the one you love, honey, love the one you with, Stephen Stills. Uh, and we did a, original song uh, work to do in uh, 72 and uh, the next record that we did the next studio record we did turned out to be uh, three plus three recorded in California recorded in Los Angeles and you were you were actually on the uh, three records that preceded that right before three plus three. They had brother to brother and those other two records yes. you were on those as well. Yes, like everything since uh, it's your thing in '69. Um, in '69, though, I was playing bass uh, or drums, and um, by the time we got to around uh, '71, I was. Um, secure enough to uh, play, uh, say, 12-string guitar on uh, Love the One You With. And 12-string uh, guitar, too, on uh, Work to Do. But so we were always it? chasing the music. What, what was it like being in the studio with your brothers at that point? Oh, that was just natural. Because you saw that you, we, we would see the music you know, uh, starting off as an idea. I mean, one night in uh, 68, uh, in the fall, Ronald came to my mother's house, uh, to our mother's house, and uh, Marvin was there, and Kelly was there, and I was there, and he said, I got this idea for a song. And he started singing, uh, it's your thing, do what you want to do, I can't tell you. Who the sock it to? What you think? And we paused. And all of us were like, yeah, um, yeah, that's got something. And uh, I know I liked uh, the idea of the way it was lyrically phrased. He never said sock it to me. He said, I can't tell you who to sock it to. And that made it uh, gave it a kind of individual kind of a uh, twist and uh, sort of singled it out. And of course, when it came out, it turned out to be like one of the monster records of that calendar year of 69. Yeah. So you said you played the bass on it. Did you also come up with the bass part or did someone else come up yes. with that? Yes. 
Yes, that's the part I had played in my mother's living room. Huh. And, uh, you know, when it was time to do it in the studio, you know, I was scared, <laughs> but but it turned out that I could do it. And, you know, it's your thing. If you really want to get an appreciation for what it sounded like live, you know, crank it. Because it was loud and it was funky. And it sounded real, real good. The horns, the guitar, the drum part, the piano, everything. And it turned out Ronald sang it in uh, on the first take. He just did one vocal lead take on that song. And uh, that's the one that's on the record. And uh, uh, the three of them uh, did one vocal take on the uh, background parts too. Well, with, I mean, with that track, you guys are really right there with the progenitors of funk. I mean, James Brown was just really getting into funk, Dance Like Stone, and you guys were right there with it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, uh, I, I always refer to it as the Frankenstein's monster hit because it was, <laughs> it was this idea that uh, it's like, man, everything about it worked. Everything worked. And when we got in the studio, you know, it just it just worked. It fit and it worked and it worked extremely well. And it turned out that uh, It's Your Thing is actually the biggest uh, 45 of all the 45s that the Isley Brothers have had in their career. The biggest seller. Well, there's good trivia for you. Yeah. But I think, uh, Ernie, this really sums up sort of that pre-3 plus 3 period right the the live record that has all those songs you were actually just mentioning um, yeah yeah we had done uh, uh is it Isaac Villas live yeah yeah that was done um, uh, at the bitter end I believe club the bitter end in 1972 uh, but uh, yeah we were chasing the music and you know, when you look at it or listen to it by way of a rear view mirror, you can see or hear with your ears the growth and the expansion, the musical expansion we were doing where we were, you know, about pushing boundaries. And uh, eventually it got to we didn't know it was going to get to three plus three or any other music that happened uh, after that, but we just kept pushing it. Of course, uh, famously, Jimi Hendrix um, worked with the Isley Brothers and spent some time in the Isley's home, I understand. So did he have an influence and impact on you gravitating toward the guitar? And did you, you know, actually learn anything from Jimi Hendrix? Well, the answer to that in a nutshell is yes. Uh, but the point being that when you go back to March of 1963, that predates the Beatles coming to America. And they got him his first Fender guitar. Happened to be white. And, uh, you know, there's a whole lot in terms of that can be spoken of when you say like someone is in your home for a little more than two years and uh, he played from the jump <laughs> he played very well I wasn't years old I had never heard anybody play a guitar like that uh, and um uh, where the music was going to go, March of 1963. You don't know where it's going to go. So it turned out that when the Beatles got to uh, Ed Sullivan in February of 64, that night, that Sunday night, uh, I was on the left side of the couch and Marvin was on the right side of the couch and Jimi Hendrix in the middle. And when Ed Sullivan said, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles, 
you know, we saw that, but, you know, there was no, like, clap of thunder. We knew that everything had changed, that there was, and it wasn't hype, uh, because of this British band and, and uh, called the Beatles. And uh, we knew that everything had changed. But um, a couple of days or so after that, there was a meeting with the whole band. And, and my eldest brother, Kelly, took the floor. And amongst other things, he said that uh, this English band has changed everything. I don't know what's going to happen to anybody, you know, even Elvis himself. But I think we're going to be all right because uh, they do shout and twist and shout. You know, they were doing that before they came to America. And Kelly said, now they got two guitar players, but we got Jimmy. And when he said, but we got Jimmy, I looked over at Jimmy and he was grinning ear to ear (laughs) at that remark. Now, you know, that was still like 64. He was around the house till about November of 65. So when they were not on the road performing, um, he was in the house. He had his guitar with him. Whenever he was playing, I would uh, pick up a social studies book or something and go into the room where he was with the living room or the dining room or whatever. And uh, I would, uh, like I was doing social studies, but actually I was observing and listening. And uh, it's quite remarkable, quite dynamic player, just as dynamic as he was later on, like 67 or so. But he was the same guy. And it's just that, uh, you know, and looking back, you know, folks may want to fast forward. Like, oh, yeah, Jimi Hendrix, yeah, he came to your house and he was hired. He was an employee and a house guest. He didn't pay for his room. He didn't pay for his food. And he was the only member of the band that was given that kind of treatment. So, of course, the other guys in the band hated him for it. <laughs> but but uh, he was like a, a member of the family, really, his, that kind of treatment. And uh, if he had it, he would have come out. He probably would have given me something between a, a bear hug and a tackle and say, man, how in the, did you ever learn how to do that? And I say, and I was listening to you in the dining room. You know, that's how I got it. He'd be laughing his head off because uh, uh, Marvin would interact with the uh, with members of the band and talk to him. And Marvin's a year younger than me. He's ten, you know, and he's talking to him. And uh, and but you know, I kept my distance, and uh, I would just, you know, if you were, if he's playing and you're in the room and you're quiet, he's just going to play. So you have a chance to hear all of this stuff. And you never know, you know, who you rub an elbows with. And, uh, like uh, my mother and grandmother used to say, God moves in mysterious ways. So, you know, when the Beatles were performing their first time, you know, the, the, there's a guitar deity, future deity, sitting on the couch. And uh, it's Jimmy. And uh, so we were always uh, glad to have been, uh, you know, one of the things that happened to him on his journey as a as a musical entity and as a family. And uh, matter of fact, there was a show at Yankee Stadium in 1969 uh, that the Isaac Brothers were going to do a festival type show in. Uh, June. And uh, Kelly picked up the phone and said, hey, Jimmy, you know, we're doing this show in a, uh, at Yankee Stadium, man. We want you to come play. He said, oh, yeah, man, I'd love to do it, but then let me talk to my people. And he called back in a couple of days and said, Kelly, you know, I'd love to do it, but uh, I got this commitment for something called the uh, Woodstock <laughs> Arts at Music Festival in August. And uh, the folks there are concerned that, you know, 
if I do a show at Yankee Stadium, I might hurt the ticket sales when it's time. <laughs> so he didn't have a crystal ball either. Uh, well, I guess Woodstock is a pretty good out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it turns turns out it was. But yeah. you see, when you're when you don't when nobody has a crystal ball to see the future, you just do not know. Nobody knows. You know, so okay, yeah, you hired a left handed guitar player and you bought him in your house right off the street. Okay. He didn't have a place to stay. And you gave him a room? Really? And you didn't charge him? Really? And it's nineteen sixty three, March? Really? Wow, what'd you do that for? You got him a brand new guitar too? A white Fender guitar that he plays left-handed? So I was I was observing that in March of 63, you know? And uh, later on when the record, when uh, All Your Experience came out and people were in my study hall were talking about it, talking about Jimmy Hendrix, I said, man, I don't have to hear the record. I already know that he can play. I know that because you know, I've heard him with and without an amp. And, uh, you know, for that's a part of his destiny that he was uh, intended to fulfill. And wow. uh, he obviously he did. Well, and I he could, just happened to be a part of that, you know. I, I could definitely go on talking to you for another hour about the Hendrix era and the whole 60s thing. But um, I, I want to move on and talk about, you know, how did you um, create or cultivate that signature Ernie Isley sound with that, you know, distortion and that sustain. And was that something you really consciously worked on creating or how did, how did it come to be? Uh, we were recording three plus three in Los Angeles. And uh, we had done the rhythm track to that lady. And I went down to uh, the guitar center on sunset and uh by myself and uh i said to uh the person waiting on me uh, let me have a strat and you know let me have a big muff and uh let's see that that pedal over there phase shifter let me try it and i plugged in and started playing and i played the rhythm guitar part in the store and I also played the lead guitar part in the store. Nobody came over to me and tapped me on the shoulder. No, there was no sense of excitement or, no, or any of that. But I knew playing in the store is like, I've got the sound I've been looking for. And uh, I came to the studio that night and said, uh, hey, man, I, gotta, I need an extra 100 bucks for this... Uh, piece of equipment and they were like uh you know ernie we're all we're, you know we're out here from new jersey and you know we got a budget and all that and what's this about and i said well i want to use it on that lady and the engineers said oh whatever you whatever you want we can get that from studio instrument rentals sir and i said okay this is the name of the pedal he said we'll have it here tomorrow and sure enough they did and uh I hooked up the pedals and had my guitar, put the headphones on. And the, that lady as a track was quite rhythmic, quite funky, quite danceable without a lead guitar. But when the lead guitar went on the track, it went from like black and white to 3D, you know, high definition. It just changed into something that uh, none of us, including me, had ever heard. And so I played all over the place and I lost it. The engineers lost it. And everybody else was kind of mummified. So for like 45 minutes after I played it, I was like, play it again! You know, <laughs> and I played it again. And uh, uh, my oldest brother Kelly just stared through the glass at me for like 45 minutes without blinking. And... Uh, then it was like, um, you know, Ernie, you're going to have to do that again and make room for the vocals. And I was like, well, vocals, man, you could, you could put it out like that and it'd be a hit. Nobody disagreed. But Ernie, you got to make room for the vocals. So I did a second tape. And after I did it, 
I was, you know, really ticked off because I liked what I did the first time better. Uh, and uh, I wanted them, I suggested erasing it. But they said, no, we leave it alone, come back and listen to it. And uh, when I heard it, like two or three days later, I was like pleased that they didn't erase it because that's the version that went on the record. But take number one was better. So, but that's that's somewhere in the cosmos. But it was take number one was like, wow, you know that's not Carlos Santana and that's not Jeff Beck and that's not Eric Clapton and that's not Jimi Hendrix. That's Ernie. Wow, you know. So that was a, a sense of discovery for all of us when uh, CBS heard the 3 Plus 3 album, and that lady for the first time, the very first time, Cole, they said, Ernie, uh, well, they said, you know, guys, it doesn't sound like it's your thing. I mean, it doesn't have trumpets or saxophones on it, but uh, we like it. And, you know, it's got many different elements working for it musically. Uh, it's got r and It's got dance. Uh, it's got this rock thing with the guitar or the Guitar, man, that's an amazing guitar thing. Yeah, it's our brother Ernie. They're like, what? You got another brother? Yeah. Actually, we got that Ernie and Marvin and a brother-in-law, Chris Jasper. They were like, what? So who's the guitar player? Ernie? was like, Ernie? Wow, man, he's, wow. You know, so, and I was all of 21 at the time. Uh, so it was an amazing uh, thing to go through and to grow through it uh certainly for us it uh was one of those records that just shattered any preconceived notions of what the osley brothers could or could not do because uh, yeah. that song like came out of nowhere summer breeze you know so, so. it set the blueprint for you guys for that whole decade Pretty much, it uh, established like we're in another part of the um, we're in another part of the forest now. That we had never, not only had we never been, no one had ever been. No, I mean, because uh, I mean, you say Isley Brothers and the same group that did Shout and Twist and Shout and This a Heart of Mine and It's Your Thing did that lady. Wow. On the one hand, it sounds like them. And on the other hand, it sounds like someone completely different. So we were not locked into any particular kind of genre or uh, cat musical category. It's like, please, you know, we, we were uh, independent of all of that. And we were only doing records that uh, established that as a fact. But Ernie, um, you know, I had uh, Chris on the show, Chris Jasper, um, and uh, we talked about, you know, the influence or impact or role that you guys played, the younger guys, in, you know, the sound and the music that was created throughout the decade with the three plus three configuration. So could you explain to me and the viewers? you know, what the typical process was like to create those grooves that we heard in the 70s? Uh, we were chasing the music and, you know, somebody come up with an idea, somebody come up with something. And if you came up with something, you know, we'd, uh, we'd all go after it. Uh, you know, like, I guess like, you know, chasing, chasing the great white whale. You know, we, we always you know, made a determination that uh, once we had whatever the song was, to go after it, to try to get it, uh, to try to get it to, to fit into what we were doing. You know, on the surface, maybe it may not, it might have felt like, no, nah, Isley's would never, nobody would ever do that. I mean, you might do is your thing, but you wouldn't do that later. But I mean, yes, we would, you know. And so uh, it's like if somebody came up with an idea, 
we'd all tackle it. Uh, we'd all do our best. Of, of course, it would all always it would change once the lead vocal went off from whatever it, you know from whatever it was that uh, anybody thought. And the the vocal background vocals it changed everything. Did did the three of you guys sort of just noodle around and play around a lot, and then when you hit on something, kind of call in the older guys and start, you know, thinking about their vocals? Um, the best way to explain it is, you know, if you have an idea, say like if I have an idea like uh, Harvest for the World or Fight the Power, I'm going to show it to them. I'm going to like audition it and say like, you know, what you think? You know, and one by one, everybody is like, yeah, you know, I, uh, that works. You know, that's going to work. That, that'll be a, uh, that'll be a song we're going to record. So, um, it was, uh, as I said earlier, a sense of, uh, you got an idea, let's work on it. Let's uh, try to finish it off as best we can before we uh, get in the studio. You know, we're, we're well rehearsed and all. And um, once that was done, it's like, okay, you got to do another song and another one and another one. You know, you got to do another album. So that was a uh, an ongoing uh, process, an ongoing challenge, which um, only after you complete it do you, you you really have a chance to enjoy it. Was it was it more typical, Ernie, that the uh, songs would begin being composed on the guitar, on the keyboard, or how did that usually flow? That would depend on the song. Um, say um, from "Go for Your Guns." Uh, Living in the life was a bass line that Marvin had. And living in the life as a song title was something that I had. And then I said, well, let's, let's call the, the thump line that Marvin's doing on bass, let's call that living in the life and build around that, whatever chords are, changes we're trying to do and then you you come up with the uh, a melody and a lyric and uh, it turns out that it works you know but sometimes when it's first introduced you know you don't you don't hear or perceive the uh, what it will sound like being completed see like that lady kept changing into something else it was a rhythm track, uh, and uh, originally it was a uh, uh, cha-cha bossa nova. Right, they recorded it in the sixties, right? sixty-four. Yeah. So when it was so when it was done again, and Ronald was talking about doing it again, I was like, "Hey, man, that's a cha-cha bossa nova." He said, "No, no, no. What we're gonna do is change the lyric, change the tempo, change the melody, and you are gonna play lead guitar on it." And I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> and so we got got to doing it. And as we got in the studio, it just changed. It changed when we recorded it. It's like the basic track is like, hey, man, that sounds good. You know, rhythm, congas, and all of that. And uh, then we put a lead guitar on it, and it was like astounding. And then... Uh, well, what are you, your lyric? What are, what are your lyrics going to be about? And we came up with the lyric, and Ronald went down there, and that particular day, he got down there before the rest of us, and sang it, and it was like, wow, that's great. And uh, when we played it, uh, when it was first played for Clive Davis, president at uh, CBS Records at the time, he said. Uh, that lady should be the single, but I'd want you to, uh, for the 45, I'd want you to repeat the first verse again. 
and, and then Faye, can you guys do that? And was like, yeah. So that was what was done. And the uh, record came out and was a, was a smash. I got to talk about, you know, how innovative the Isley Brothers were during that three plus three period. I mean, this was during a time when almost all of the R&B funk bands, they all had horn sections. They all had big extended bands for the most part. You guys were mostly self-contained unit, um, which other groups did too, but they had so many other, you know, especially the horns, you know, so it sounds like it was a conscious decision that you made to not have horns between that and Ronald's, you know, just distinctive, fantastic uh, vocals and your, um, you know, distinguished guitar playing and, and the bass and the rhythm and the ballads that sounded like nobody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Isley Brothers was such a unique entity. Um, tell me about that and, and not going with horns and, and going against the, uh, hor uh, the grain of sort of what was happening in the 70s. Well, you know, that starts with listening to everything. And so there were records that didn't necessarily, that we listened to that didn't necessarily have horns. Um, like, uh, I could say Fleetwood Mac or Frampton Comes Alive. Uh, some of the things Stevie Wonder did. Some of it did have, you know, superstition and horns, but some things didn't. Uh, and for us to make the records like we were making it only meant that folks were going to know when the record came on who that was, because that was one of the things that made us different. So um, you do a song like uh, Between the Sheets, it doesn't have horns or Footsteps in the Dark, or Voice to Atlantis, or uh, Harvest for the World. Doesn't have horns, but they could hear it and know, you know, hear Ronald's voice and say, yeah, that's Isley. Mm -hmm. Or hear the guitar and say, yeah, that's Isley. Uh, and um, that was one of the things that we, we appreciated. Uh, we didn't necessarily uh, say we weren't going to use horns, but uh, when you'd hear the songs, the way they were presented, the keyboard or guitars, you know, the, yeah, that's the sound. And you got more to sound of the Isley Brothers. You know, background vocals, uh, lead, you know, there's, there's no horns on uh, For the Love of You. Uh, there's no horns on uh, the cover version of uh, Todd Rundgren's uh, Hello, It's Me. You know? So you just got into really listening to what was there. You know? Sort of make you like a, a musical connoisseur. And um, you know that was the way we decided to do it. 